We're glad to know that you're still there and watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. And uh, it's time now to look at some of the national dailies and see what uh, are the headlines this morning. And today we're going to begin with a business day. And this is very gladdening, maybe. Uh, airlines funds face no delays on FX reforms. So there's always been that complaint about uh, funds for airlines facing some delays. So now, with the reforms, no more of that. Another headline there is Nigeria expects to $20 billion as oil projects get green light. Mm. Okay. Uh, we are also having uh, commercial papers up 89% in H1 as firms raise 789 billion naira. All right. Poor investment in research worsens Nigeria's health outcome. Federal government's 27.82 trillion naira infrastructure budget fails to dent deficit. Mm. Okay, we'll move from uh, Business Day to another newspaper. That will be a Punch newspaper this morning. Punch newspaper uh, leads with the story. NLC protests Tinubu's 500 billion naira subsidy palliative uh, demands 300% pay rise. And the writers on that story, uh, reps sit on 500 billion naira subsidy relief request today. Federal government labor uh, for fresh uh, negotiations. 500 billion naira not enough for 125 million poor Nigerians affected by deregulation. That's according to NLC and TUC. Uh, okay, um, we also have smaller headlines there on the punch. Reps probe contract, contract fraud, revenue leakages in Nimasa. House to investigate 14-year power outage in Ondo community. Then uh, boards, OB kicks as Tinubu offers opposition governor's slots. Nigeria redeems $500 million bond despite revenue challenges. And Army Chief orders IPOB raid rubbishes amnesty for bandits. All right. We'll move from Punch to The Guardian. We're taking it fast, 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 fast. Sharp, sharp, as we call it in Nigeria. Uh, the Guardian leads with tough times for students, parents, as schools hike fees by 200%. Amid $1 billion legacy debts, Nigeria pushes for $12 billion revenue, 10 gas FIDs. Tinubu writes reps for 500 billion naira to cushion subsidy removal impact. And this very disturbing one, vandals steal second Niger bridge fittings. I call it disturbing because so many lives could be lost. So many businesses could be lost because of that singular act. Now we'll move from The Guardian to The Nation newspaper. The Nation newspaper happens to be the final one for this morning. And Nation leads with the headline, Tinubu, remedy for subsidy withdrawal hardship soon. Okay. President asks lawmakers to approve 500 billion naira palliatives cash. Now, CBN directs payments of dollar receipts in Naira. Okay. And then uh, investors' confidence now boosted, says NGX. Federal government states to partner on electricity. All right. Every other um, headline that you see on the nation there has already been read from the punch. So when you get the nation, the punch, the guardian, or business day newspaper, you'll find the stories that I've just read out here now and more on those papers and so many other national dailies. But we're glad to have been joined by architect Ezekiel Nyaito, public affairs analyst, uh, speaking to us from Kwaibom, I hope. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Good morning and thanks for having me as always. Oh. Yes, speaking from Akwaibo, that lovely place you need to be here. I know, but how much is uh, petrol in Akwaibo? Uh, because of happy hour, we are not thinking of that for now. <laughs> so the happy hour is still going on. 
That's Maybe. interesting. Okay, that's Maybe. good. From the uncommon governor to the yeah, yeah. The of the golden age. Yes. Golden you guys are having it very, very rosy in Aquaibom. We thank God for yeah. the leaders you have had. Um, they do the chop by chop kind of thing. So, so no matter what goes under the bridge, so long as the infrastructure, as the infrastructure is, <laughs> is showing. All right, Mr. Nyaitok, um, let's go to the headlines now. Let's begin with um, uh, the Punch. The Punch newspaper is what I want to begin with. Um, the leading story on the Punch is kind of like a, a combining two. NLC protests Tinubu's 500 billion naira subsidy palliative demand 300% pay rise. We know that Tinubu has written to Revs uh, to approve 500 billion naira for, to cushion the effect of uh, subsidy removal uh, in the first place. Now, I tried to do some mathematics, 500 billion uh, naira divided by 120 people, uh, that 120 million people will give you like 4,666 naira. That is what it is, because I cannot say a section of Nigeria is rich, the others are poor, when we are talking about this thing, we should be talking about 120 million Nigerians that need this money, that need some kind of palliative in one way or the other. Now, let's talk about that. What is your take on the fact that, first of all, the president is asking for 500 million naira to cushion the effect of palliative, um, billion naira to cushion the effect of uh, uh, subsidy removal? Okay, the very first thing, I always work from what I call first principles. Mm. What do you want to achieve? That's question number one. The removal of the subsidy has affected the poor adversely. So primarily, the poor are the target of the subsidy removal and consequently the palliatives. That is the first thing you keep down as the foundational essence. Number two, you ask yourself, what do you need and what do you have the capacity to acquire? Because you may need 10 trillion, but the reality means that you can only get 500 billion. Now, if 500 billion is the very best you can get because you are the president, you sit on the seat, and we can do our postulations, but you know the essence, you know the extent you can go, you know your limit. So we take 500 billion. Question number three is, how do you apply the 500 billion to reach your target audience? Now you've done a simple math. Wonderful. Great. Four, yes, it's about 4,600 and something naira. Yeah. But I did mine as somebody who wanted to be a governor, who still desires to be a governor. I did my mathematics a little differently. What I did was, I said, if that 500 billion was shared amongst the 36 states, and let's add the federal capital territory as well, then you are going to have something in the neighborhood of 13.8 billion per state. In Akwaibom State, we have 2,226 villages, which means that if I was to send to every village, they will have something in the neighborhood of about 5 million naira. And I asked myself, if 5 million naira was to come into my village on the palliative basis, there are one, two, three things I, I could do in that village. Number one, I could gather the women and be able to give them certain funds that they will be able to go to and trade with, not to eat, okay? It's like a microcredit stuff. Imagine me, I have, say, five million in my village. Every woman would be able to go home with a minimum of 50,000 naira to start with. And we say, out of this 50,000 naira, apply about 30,000 to your farm or to your, you know, uh, trade or anything you want to do. And then 
keep this other one to be able to help you with your transportation and then the food and everything. Now, I will still have substantial amount. After sharing, I'll still have a minimum of about three million. That three million, I could apply it to grade virtually all the roads, just grade in the village at a time like this, so that the, the, the farmers will have access to their farms and be able to, you know, cultivate more and be able to come back and they already have some money in their pocket. Now, the poor in all the villages, if this concept is applied to uh, across the board to other, uh, other villages in Nigeria, one thing will be sure, the money would have gone to the target audience. If you want to do all these conditional transfers, just let me... <coughs> Sorry. Excuse me. If you, if you want to do what we normally do, we'll just realize that we don't have any data, we don't have any statistics, we don't have any number of people who just hear that certain amount of money has gone out, and that will be the end of the story. Then there's a second leg or a second arm to this story. The second arm is a body called NLC. Because of that, they are starting to fight. Increase salary. Do this. Do that. This palliative thing should not be an NLC matter. Let's get that very clear. I have nothing against workers being paid living wage. I love it. But for now, palliative is for Nigerians. Nigerians. And whatever method or strategy they want to adopt must be a strategy that will benefit generality of Nigerians. Yeah, but if, it, if, it's for, if, if it's for Nigerians, who will drive the process? Because if you're talking, the way you were giving your analysis, it seemed as if you will, you will personally go to the villages and see that these things are done. Let's take, for instance... Um, no, no, doing, no, no, let me tell you. Let me, let, tell you let me just give you this picture now. Okay, okay. You okay. have five million that will go to a community, every community, yeah. except you're transferring yeah. it to the bank account of that community, which a lot of communities do not have. You will have to take it no, there. No, 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 that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'll put the record straight. There's a very clearly defined administrative procedure that governments don't take advantage of. Which is? I'll come back to Aquaibom. In Aquaibom has 31 local governments. The 31 local governments each has a paramount ruler. Mm. And then within the local government, you now have clans. And we all have clan heads. We are that organized. Mm. And I believe it applies to other places. Within the clans, you have villages. We have village heads. And each of these people must be brought into the net of the administration of the of, of, of the state for you to create peace because if you are, people talk about you know uh, you know uh, 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 state policing and everything there are other systems and structures if you are a serious governor that you can use now what stops you from making your village head a sheriff in every village and do you know that every village they know everybody you make that your village head, a sheriff of some sort, you give him some office capacity, and because of, you know, even personal inducement or interest, anything that happens to the peace of your place, I remove you. As simple as that. You first, you know, I had very, very clearly worked out, you know, paradigms and, and structures for the administration of peace, and that structure can be used in this case I'm bringing all the paramount rulers, within your paramount rulers, get all your clan heads, within the clan heads, we are sending this money, take care of your village head, and all the village heads, you are responsible for you to give me the report of what I'm sending down. It works like magic in a Bomb state. I don't know of other states, but I want to tell you that there's already a system and a structure in place. Out of the 2,226 villages in Akwaibo, I visited over 2,000 of them during this election, sat down with NTA crew, had their problems documented on tape 
so that these problems are the ones you bring up and say, let's attack this, attack this, because when you give them the cash on one hand, you give them the template of development on the other hand, there is also the priority of the village. Maybe they want to have a market, and I want to tell you that with as little as 200,000, you can have a little market in a little village. Administering the, 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 the needs of the poor is not as complicated. We just don't care about it. That's why in my social governance ideology, it targets me to these people. That's on one hand. But there is yet another program. There's something you call, you know, the initiative that, that mixes, you call it enterprise estates. Enterprise estates that we've developed has to do with, you know, a housing scheme in villages that incorporates enterprise, you know, uh, one form or the other. Now, if you do that in, in every village, you would have trained the people, you would have encouraged things like agriculture at little or no cost because the houses are easy to build. And then in building the houses, housing development is one of the fastest ways and quickest ways and most effective ways of getting money down to the people. Because in housing delivery, the locals bring the sand, they bring the labor, they bring the rods, they bring the cement, they bring the everything that is needed. And they bring the, 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 the labor, like I said. So there are very ingenious ways of getting money to the locals if we sincere about it. Okay, well, um, we will talk so much extensively about this uh, same topic uh, later on with another guest, uh, but it happened to be one of the biggest headlines and you needed to address it. Okay, but let's move to another thing. Uh, some people, especially, like, it's still in, on the punch. Uh, one of the headlines there says, uh, boards will be... Uh, Kicks as Tinubu offers opportunity or okay, opposition governor's slots, whatever his reasons might be. Uh, but the present administration is giving slots to uh, members of the opposition parties uh, in this government, and some people are not comfortable with that. What do you think about it? Two things. Number one is that it is the prerogative of the man in power to decide how he wants to run his administration. You know, I'm always an obedient, you know, guy. But in this case, I know, I understand where he's coming from and what he's saying, but he has to understand that for as long as um, Mr. Tinubu or Obong Tinubu is the president, you know, in the office, his style, whatever he wants to do, he is constitutionally allowed to, number one. Number two, he has to know that this man knows that the case is still in court and that until the Supreme Court, you know, hits the final gavel, it can go anywhere. So it is only natural, it is only expected that he's going to pay a lot of emphasis on the sort of things that will make Nigerians say, oh yeah, then this makes sense. And within that context, I mean, it's only commonsensical. I agree with him. Usually I hit him a lot of times on things I think he's not doing well. It's only commonsensical for him to reach across the aisle and deplete the camp of the enemy by bringing them onto his side because there's still a chance there could be a rerun. And if there's a rerun for whatever, and somebody already has food in his mouth, he's going to say, my guy, I mean, wait, this is where I don't call it, make I finish and first. You understand me? So it's a smart move that uh, Obon Tinubu is doing. And then um, politically, it is expedient. And also, everybody is talking of national healing, national reconciliation. So it actually even fits into the lingo or the expectations of the people, you know, per time or at the present time. So I think that the guy is being clever. And uh, Mr. Obi, he has to pray, pray hard that uh, he can hold back his people because I happen to be in the know that um, there's a lot of talk and a lot of meetings at the night. And people are saying, oh boy, I've suffered too much. Oh, if this can finally come my way, I beg, I don't try. You know, all those things. But in terms of sticking to principles, ideologies, I think that only the obedient movement, you know, those people within that real hardcore camp, you know, can stand with their leader to the end. But they form a certain percentage. Others were like bandwagon effect. Everybody's moving and we move on. If they start coming to town, we all go to look. So he's got to do a lot of praying to God that um, that things go his way. And there's still that possibility. Okay. 
Well, um, we've had problems in the aviation industry for some time, uh, some time now, and that some, especially foreign airlines, complain about their money being delayed for whatever reason and all that. And right now on business day, we've just seen headlines saying airlines funds face no delays on FX reforms. Um, maybe this is a good um, news for us. But what kind of reforms actually will address the, uh, this problem that has been like a perennial problem in the aviation industry where funds are being withheld for years and years? There are two sets of funds that you must understand clearly. There is the current ticket sales. In the current ticket sales, because of the closure of the difference between the official and the parallel rates, a lot of money is starting to come into the system. I'll give you a little example. I have money, I've been working in the US, and then I have a lot of money, and I want to send it back home. How do I send it through the official structure who will have sent my money at a rate that doesn't make sense? How do I now send it through the barrel market? How do I bring in the funds? So a lot of people could not bring in their funds. But now, because we now say, look, there's almost no differential between them. I mean, it's minimal. People are now happy to send in their funds, okay? And on account of that, there is a lot of, you know, dollars in circulation. Forget about this issue of it going up to 80, and it's going to take a little while, but it's going to stabilize, and I, I predict that the exchange rate is going to come down with time. I look at it coming down to something in the neighborhood of 500, you know, um, naira to a dollar. I'm not an economist, but I'm just um, kind of forecasting. That is on one hand. But there is the second arm. The second arm is the money that was there before. Now, assuming you had in a, a before now $10 million, that $10 million, if you multiply by the rate, official rate at that time, which is, was going to be by maybe about by 460, maybe it would have been 460 million uh, naira that you needed to get that your $10 million out. But now that the rate has gone up to 700, instead of looking for 460, you're going to look for about 700. So that's going to make it very difficult for the money that was owed in the past on how to get it out. Okay? So because the money was not owed as in Naira or as in dollars, it was owed as in Naira to exchange to dollars. So right now, who is going to do that conversion? Because they are going to say, you were not owing us 400 million Naira. You were owing us $4 million. You understand? So I need my $4 million. So for you to get that $4 million, you have to you know, uh, exchange it at the current rate, which is going to be almost twice now. You know, an increase of a minimum of, uh, say, about 40 to 60%. So how they are going to resolve what they were being owed is, I think, the elephant in the room. But going forward, things are going to become easier. And I foresee a situation where there's a compromise struck somewhere along the line. You know, this money was supposed to be 400 million naira, but now it's about 700 million naira. We can't get that differential. So what do we do? Can we meet halfway? I think that there will be a negotiation on what was being owed. But going forward, it will be easier for us to exchange our ticket. And um, I think that's it. Okay, but um, is that also like the NGX is saying that investors' confidence has uh, uh, been boosted now? Do you also believe no. that investors' confidence has been boosted? No, no, no. Let me tell you, let me tell you something. There are some policies that are coming up that are very good. For instance, looking at all the tax reforms, to make sure that all the concept of multiple taxation that they are being, you know, um, you know, being looked into, they are being reformed. But there is yet that elephant in the room, and that elephant in the room is that every investor, forget what they say, they are just planning, looking, and hoping they will not take a decision until the Supreme Court makes a final determination on who will be the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Anything that anybody is telling you is balderdash, is hogwash, is not, is not, is not, is not factual. 
have interacted with, with international expo, you know, um, 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 uh, investors for, I was one of the first people that brought Shell to Africa to Nigeria, and that was over 20 years ago. I've been ex exposed to this international community for a long time, and I know they are thinking, and I still have the relationships, and they are saying, architect, we've got to see the end, we've got to wait. What are, if Obi comes, what are his policies? What are, what are his mindsets? If Atiku comes, what are his policies? What are his mindset? Now we know that of um, uh, 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 Tinubu, and we know his policies, his mindset. So they are waiting just a few more months, you know, in the next uh, three, four months, because the current electoral act makes it clear that whatever it is, the final decision will be done within um, six months. That's what it is. So what the investors are doing, are they are just looking at possibilities, then at the end, they want to see the, the policies of each person. If it is Tinubu that is going to continue, it's easier because they've already started the analysis. But if it is another person that comes in, like uh, Mr. Peter Obi, then they are going to wait to see his own policies, to see to do what extent he's going to adopt the current policies, to see to what extent there's going to be a policy consistency or a major and fundamental difference in shift. So investors are just studying and analyzing us. And they are going to take the next maybe about three months until they can now start making the move. Anyone that makes a move now has been a friend of the governor. He's trying to give the governor some level of confidence to show the body language that things are happening. But in terms of real, you know, um, uh, unbiased investor coming in, no, they are still watching Nigerians. But what I can say is that a lot of the policies of the present administration, they are investor friendly and they will be able to encourage, you know, the investors to come in. They need to just address one, two, three issues. One of such issues is the issue of peace and, and, um, and security. There was something that Mr. President did and, uh, concerning um, re removal of subsidy. As soon as he came in, he took that decision. Now he can also take decision with respect to you know insecurity. We haven't seen that yet. There's something he can do decisively. Now this Namdi Kanu put it on the table. What do we do? He can take that decision within a week and communicate it. He goes, come, let's talk. You see, the situation is this. Now this guy in uh, Finland, what's his name? He could take that decision with yes, yes, whatever his name, I'm not even interested. He could take that decision within this week. On, on IPOP, on ESN, on Nam De Kano, and this guy in Finland. He can take that decision. That decision alone can bring instant peace to, to Southeast. Then he now looks at the banditry and the rest in the North. There's something he can do. You know, you know, this, you see, government is powerful. What we've been lacking so much is the willpower. But I want to tell you that if the governor, if the Mr. President wants to stop insecurity in the north, he knows what to do. He knows the meeting to have. He knows the matching orders to give. I'm telling you that for a fact. You know, these things have consequences. So did the issue of subsidy removal have consequences. Everybody was afraid. But it came. And, you know, there's something that we normally get mixed up. He actually did not remove subsidy. No. Buhari did. But what he did was to say that thing we were discussing is gone. And just that statement is gone, which was not correct. It was not gone. It still had about a month to go. They said subsidy is gone. Just that alone. Just boom, sent the body language across Nigeria. And because he did that on that day, he was able to see through. If he had allowed it to come to an end, you know, before addressing it, there would have been this lobby, there would have been this pressure, there would have been this and that. I, the pressures that governments face is terrible. That's why the Bible says, pray for men in authority. There's a, there's, a, there's a reason. We all go to grab, won't go to get. But how many of us are close enough to heads of government, governors to know the headache they face on a, a daily basis? I won't have a meeting with my past governor, immediate past. That meeting should have been maybe about 10 minutes or 15. It lasted for one and a half hours. And it was a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Do you understand me? And, and the pressures they face, we don't know. We just see the siren and we think, oh, the man is living the life. He's not living the life. That's why I've made up my mind, any governor I can have access to, I'm not talking of contract appointment. No, 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 no. 
that you can sit down with him without putting pressure on him and tell him and listen to him and be able to give advice that will help to move the system. Please, if you have access, forget about what you get from it. Any day a governor wants to give you something, he knows what to do. But be there for him. Be there as a friend. Talk as somebody that cares about the problems he's going through. They have headache. Abiola said something. Abiola said the bigger the head, the bigger the headache. Late MKO. <laughs> Governors have wahala. They have problems. There are also some people coming to their office with diabolical this and that and that. Sometimes they finish up a meeting and they finish a meeting and your head is like, you really don't know what was said, what wasn't said. <laughs> so let's learn to go close to our governors, pray for them, advise them, help them. And the same thing, if a governor can need this, imagine what the president needs. Mm -hmm. Let's not just say, oh, Tinubu, 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 let's help him. Oh. Okay, uh, well, let's go to um, another one. Uh, this time it's about education. We've seen that uh, uh, foreign edu getting a, a, an education outside Nigeria, now the, the fees are like 60% up. But there's this story on The Guardian, which is also talking about a possibly uh, back home in Nigeria. Tough times for students and parents. Uh, school fees uh, are hiked by 200%. We see that in private schools. We see that even in our universities today, what they're paying is more than double of what they used to pay just two years ago. And it is really, really tough on the students and their parents. What does that say about the education in Nigeria, getting an education? Because the greatness of a nation is not by population, but it's by how many people are educated usefully. So. What do you say about this uh, situation where the, the fees and everything will have to go up? Whether you're getting it outside the country or you're getting it within the country, you have to spend through your nose. Yeah, the first thing is that the fees outside the country have not increased. They have not increased. The problem is that the Naira, the $10,000 you used to pay, you probably needed in the past with this uh, you know, um, going through Central Bank and everything, it probably needed about um, 400 and something, you know, uh, 4 point something million naira. But now you are going to need about almost 8 million naira for the same $10,000 that you used to pay. Okay? So their $10,000 is a constant, but the naira that is needed to drive that has almost doubled. So for all the people that have their children abroad, Heaven help all of you, because there's really not much anything can be done about that. That's number one. Number two, coming back home, you know, we take advantage of things unnecessarily, and it bothers me, because, you know, I was coming from the, I'll just do a very quick analysis. I was coming from the airport, and the man told me, okay, because of wealth subsidy, instead of um, being about 10,000 naira, it's now about 20,000 naira. And I told him that he was being silly. And I told him off. I said, we take advantage of things. If you were buying 10 liters, you know, assuming the trip was 10 liters at 200 naira, you know, you'd probably be using 2,000 naira. Now, at 500 liters, you're using 5,000 naira. Now, the, the, former, the difference in, in terms of cost to you is about, in petrol is about 4,000 naira. So why are you doubling the fare to 10,000 naira? You know, we, we take advantage of everything. Why would, you know, if you look at the analysis that you have in the papers, I think it is in the Guardian, fees are moving from 20,000 to 80,000 to 100,000 naira. And uh, what's the basis? Yeah, that's it. What's the basis? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, there's no rational argument that you can use to tell that something will move from 20,000 naira to 80,000 naira because of what? I think we're just taking advantage of the situation. And unfortunately, so this is, you know, a country like Malaysia, you know, I was just talking with a guy yesterday. He said, you go to Malaysia all the time. I said, yeah, there are certain things about Malaysia that I just, I just like. In that country, everything is regulated. We can't do that here. Even to the price of uh, you know, what they call the sugar and things. You can't just, you know, fix price. Any. Then we have a body called the Consumer Protection Agency. What they, are, what they are protecting, I really don't understand. I don't even know the essence of it. I don't know the powers they have. I don't know. So once in a while, they come out and talk and then they do some work, but... I think that the time has come when we need to have a very, very, very serious conversation with us. 
you know, I was listening to one of the stations yesterday and I sent a very, very great, um, it wasn't your station, now one, I won't call the name, a very one of the biggest, um, you know, producers, you know, or the anchor persons. And he made a statement and I, I told him that I'm taking a back at how you would trivialize the issue of National Orientation Agency. As far as I'm concerned, if there's one appointment I would lobby for in Nigeria, I've never accepted any appointment. Anybody who knows me knows that I don't take appointments. If there's one appointment I will lobby for, or lobby for whoever is there to get funding, a good person, is the National Orientation Agency. We need to start refocusing our minds. We need to work on our minds. Our thinking is so, is so, is so warped. It's so out of sync with realities that we, the, the people in power, have no understanding of and the essence of why they are there. What is government? How many people understand chapter 2, section 14, subsection 2B as the essence of government? Government has become an enterprise that you go to once you get it, you are made. It's for you, yourself, and yourself. And, and these are things that we need to really come back to interrogate. See, when we are electing, what's the base of our electing somebody? Hey, let my person also go. You know, this turn by turn thing is taking root in Nigeria. And these are the things that are destroying us because certain fundamentals like excellence are things that are time stated. They are statute of general application. They are the only things that will bring us to where we ought to be. Having good conscience, excellence, having focus, being professional, square pegs in square holes, anything short of that will take us back to where we are today. The poverty capital of the world, the most endowed country in the whole world. I say that without any fear of contradiction, has become the capital, uh, the poverty capital of the world. What a contradiction. Because, like the Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Nigerians are good people. They are wonderful people. Just give them the right information, and they'll be able to show the line. So that issue of information, if we had the right information, we will not be having these things about school fees going the way they are going and everything going haywire. Okay, well, uh, let's just wrap up with this. Um, we do hope that uh, the education system will not suffer that much because uh, we need to be educated. Uh, the CBN directs payment of dollar receipts in Naira. That should have just followed uh, when, when we're talking about uh, uh, dollar and every other thing. So how, do you, how does that work out? How will that be an advantage to us and all that? CBN directs payment of dollar receipts in Naira. Will it help in the strength of the Naira? You see, they are, they are, I, I will not talk too authoritatively in this area because I need to be careful. But one thing is, is, um, is, has bothered me all along. Now, you are in Nigeria. You work in Nigeria. But your remuneration is rated in dollars or dollar denominated. When I went to get a facility from Shelter Africa, the, the, the challenge that we had, which is why I have not gone back, is if I borrow, say, $5 million from you, and that $5 million is an equivalent of, say, about, let me just use a word, you know, a figure that we can easily convert, is equivalent of a hundred million naira. Okay? And I'm to repay you in five years. Can we reach an agreement where we denominate that five million naira in, in five million dollars in naira? Such that even if you want to look at the inflation, not inflation, the exchange rate fluctuations, you kind of pick a certain exchange rate that we have as a benchmark so that at the end of the day, I am repaying you the Naira as agreed and not that I'm paying you back dollars. So whatever time we reach, you know, along the line, whatever is the exchange rate, you know, Imagine that you borrowed, you borrowed five million dollars at a stage when the naira was about um, one seventy something. 
and now you have been repaying and repaying and repaying, a stage comes that the dollar is now, the Naira is about 800 to a dollar. It makes absolute nonsense of your capacity to repay. So can we have a conversation where we ourselves know that whoever is giving us money knows that he wants to get his money back, but how do we make sure that we have this conversation where we have a certain level of you know predictability in our foreign exchange unless we have that conversation we will have this risk of our producers our investors being slaves to people they borrow money from or people who borrow lend money not being willing to give money to nigerians because of our adverse you know capital repatriation policy so I, I don't know i've not looked at that but i think it's a conversation that we need to have if we are going to have a robust you know a, 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 you know investment climate and be able to attract foreign investment and then also have sustainable business there are too many businesses that started well but because they got some foreign exchange uh, foreign uh, in inflow they, they they've, they've run out because they can't they can't repay again because of the fluctuation and the unpredictability. You can have a cash flow that gives you a five years projection. And that is what government is not, or rather investment is not trade that you buy today and sell tomorrow. No. Industries, you have, that's why you have something called moratorium. They allow you some time to be able to like um, recoup and then the repayment is usually spread over maybe five years or ten years. But if you make a mistake of getting foreign loan, by the time you just do your cash flow, after the first year, everything just goes haywire and you don't even know what to do again. The worst thing, the, the worst case scenario is you abandon the business and tell them, let them just fold up, take what is, and then you cut your losses and you, are, you get up worse off than you were before. It's an investment decision that we must take as a people and as a government. Okay, uh, well, thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Nyaito, for coming on the program today and helping us make sense of the headlines uh, that we read out this morning. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Privilege. Thank you, God bless you. Okay, we've been talking with architect Ezekiel Nyaito, a public affairs analyst, talking to us from Akwaibom. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll go straight to our first hot topic. Stay with us. <laughs>